last week I um, took us through chapter seven and within it, we developed a package to wrap the Gio, Gio um, JavaScript library, um, which I'll, uh, I'll, I'll show you in a bit later. Um, the, the code for doing that's all in the book. Um, what we're going to do today is um, fill in a couple of things that weren't covered last week, where um, there's some very, some rather advanced topics um, covered in chapter eight of the book on things like um, um, kind of resizing figures and, and things and, and, and specifying dependencies and, and, and stuff. The, the, the contents of chapter eight, which is what we're going to be talking about today, Sorry, I should probably introduce this properly. Right, so this is the JavaScript for R book club um, that we hold on the R for Data Science um, Slack community um, and, and that gets posted on, on YouTube. Um, and today we're talking about chapter eight, which is called Advanced Topics um, in, in the book. Um, the, the, the topics studied in, in chapter eight are, are kind of... Um, a, a diverse collection of things really that probably just didn't fit into the other chapters as, as we were working through them. But we're getting towards the end of the, the first big section of the book, which is where um, the, the R package HTML widgets is, is introduced and, and the um, syntax and, and things that you have to use in order to um, wrap a JavaScript library with HTML widgets such that you can create um, a, a function that you can call from R and which will populate data into that JavaScript library such that you can visualize it in HTML or a, a shiny app or something like that. Um, yes, so um, the examples in the chapter today relate to this um, visualization library called chio.js. Um, sorry, I'll pull that over in a second. Um, where's the website here? Right, so this website here. Um, so with this, you can generate images that look like this, where you're connecting points on the globe and the arcs on the visualization have, have some relation to the kind of intensity of flow of, be it a, a flow of product from one country to another, a flow of information along communication lines or something like that. Um, the, the visualizations are very neat. Um, and it, it, I mean, potentially this is a very complicated library, but. So what we did last week was develop a package where we have a single function that can generate one of these images. Oh, could I, could you? Oh, uh, right, okay. Um, sorry, you can see my screen, can't you? Okay, yeah, cool. Um, yes, so in the, the documentation for this library, there's a few examples and we worked through the process of converting those examples over into um, a, an HTML widgets based Java, uh, R package that would populate uh, uh, the, the, the necessary content on a HTML page to create one of these visuals. Um, okay, so I'll get chapter eight up. Um, Okay, um, because there's quite diverse contents and it's quite a long chapter, we're not going to talk about it, it all this, this week. Um, so there's, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about the JavaScript scoping rules. There's uh, a particular, the, there's a few different scoping rules in JavaScript. So that's like the, the kind of programming semantics I'm, I'm talking about there. Um, and because we need to know a little bit about that in order to 
do um, to create widgets that can s resize in response to um, you know the size of a page changing and, and things in in um, on the browser side. Um, there's a little section on kind of adding additional HTML content, so adding like a title or a subtitle to a widget. Um, there's a, a quite um, interesting section on JavaScript dependencies and slightly more advanced ways of handling dependencies between JavaScript libraries in, in the chapter, which is quite interesting. Um, and what they talk about here is the um, where you might have an optional JavaScript library. So um, if the user wants to use a particular library, um, sorry, so you might write a widget that uses a particular principal library in, in JavaScript, so like the Jio um, library. But um, by m having optional libraries available that you, you may add a kind of richer um, um, setting for the for, for for the use of that. So we we talk later on about a a package that can give you um, statistics about the visualization that you're making. Um, um, you can also talk. It also talks about overlapping and conflicting JavaScript dependencies, um, and we'll, we'll talk about that as well. And there's a little section at the very end of the chapter about efficient data transfer. So the stuff that we've done so far in this, you have your data in an R session. Um, you serialize it into JSON. That is transferred across the wires to a browser and is embedded in an HTML page from which a JavaScript um, script can access that data, convert it into whatever form it needs in order for you to visualize it. So there's a lot of steps going on there, a lot of data conversion, um, transfer, reconversion. And there's a section at the end where they discuss whether there may be a more efficient way to get your data across to the, the JavaScript, um, you know, the running JavaScript in, in the browser. Um, which I must admit I, I, I'm not particularly fluent in, but basically it boils down to you could either have within your JavaScript script, you could have um, some code that pulls directly from a server, or you could en embed your data in one of the kind of static files that's served along with your site. Um, and that may provide a more efficient way and also a way whereby the, the data itself isn't actually viewable in the HTML page. Um, anyway, there's a few other things that are talked about. Um, so that is uh, transferring JavaScript code itself, the actual, you know, the, um, the, the JavaScript syntax from R to a browser. Um, I'm not gonna talk about that because I, to be honest, I didn't see much of a, a use case for it. Um, but I was having a look at the um, the HTML widgets vignettes. Um, uh, give a few examples of um, widget packages that use this syntax. So the, the purpose here is to provide the user of your widget, the ability to write a JavaScript function that can be passed over along with their data and which can, you know, modify how that's presented or, or, or something. Um, um, yeah, I so there's, there's better examples, I think, in the HTML widgets vignette than there is in the book itself. And uh, to be honest, I didn't see the uh, the use for that in the in the in the book, but um, there's another function um, which you, as the developer of the widget, might write 
um, which so this is an argument used in in create widgets which is a way to modify um, the a, a widget object before sending it across to someone's browser um, so the the use case for that is uh, that they talk about in the book is supposing your um, users have created a data frame that they've passed into your um, widget function um, but you don't necessarily need all of the columns of that data frame you can use a um, pre-render hook to filter out to, to filter to just keep the two or three columns that you actually need from that data frame um, and there's a little bit about unit testing um, um, but I'm, I'm not going to cover that because it, it, it basically is suggesting that the, the HTML widget object that's returned by your R function can be used in, in tests that much like any other R object could be um right let's move on um so okay so um the javascript side of the 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 widget that we were developing last week looks looks like this so um i had a, a function new gio um that's called by the r user this is the the kind of JavaScript code that it uses um, that you know it passes over to um, and and gets embedded in the HTML. Um, the render value function is something that we've talked about in 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 quite some depth over the past couple of weeks. So this is where you might um, specify how to call the JavaScript library that you're using. Um, and for for GIO, you'd set up a a controller object into which you'd then add some data and then you would do something like print to the screen or, or render or something i can't remember exactly what the method was called that's great um but um an, an issue with setting up that object here inside the render value function is that um, if you need to provide a, a, a kind of custom way of like resizing your object in response to changes in the browser, um, then the controller itself may not be available here. So um, there's a simple workaround for this. Um, so basically you want this controller object setting up a, a point in this kind of function factory whereby it's available to both this function and this function because the resize might call a, a, a method on that object. Um, and to get to that, I'm going to talk about our function scope instead. Um, so here we've defined a function make adder which will construct a function that so to this function you provide a single argument you know some some number and it will return to you a function that can add that argument to any other user supplied argument so here we make a function that adds 10 to its to this this call here creates a function that will add 10 to any subsequent argument. Um, so you set up, so you call this kind of function factory, I guess you could call it. Um, the function, the inner function here can access this Y and also this X here, because that's in a kind of outer scope the inner function can access that. But this inner function is returned to the user. So here, when we're doing this, the inner function is returned with y taking the value 10 kind of embedded into it. That y value can still be accessed when this inner function is returned to the user because the, the kind of environment in which it evaluates is enclosed. 
Um, and that kind of function scope where you can reach above yourself to to find kind of variables that, that are, are active um, kind of holds up in in JavaScript. So um, they they have they have a few different scoping rules. There's like global scope and function scope, and there was something else that I noticed in the when I was researching this. This relates to function scope. So here we're setting up a controller object in this kind of outer scope here. That object can now be accessed by both this function and also this function. So it's it is very similar. So even after you have returned this pair of functions to whatever the call site was that called this factory function, the functions within there can access the controller that's set up. So it's similar in, in some ways to our scoping rules. The, I mean, the, a world of difference between JavaScript and R, but um, that in itself seemed quite similar. Um, yes, so, um, so that's, so that's a little kind of bit of information about scoping and how, how that might be used in that resize function, but we're not actually going to talk about that resize function yet. Um, um, so for sizing um, a, a widget, there are a few things to consider. There's firstly, what's the size of the image going to be when um, it is initially created and, and placed on the screen? And then also, how should that image respond to changes in the, you know, the browser window uh, to, um, you know, the user interacting with the page and things like that. Um, there are a few other issues. So, for example, should should the, 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 the kind of sizing rule, should it depend on the context in which the page is viewed? So if it's on a, a, a mobile tablet or something like that versus um, in a desktop browser, or if it's being viewed in the RStudio viewer versus a um, um, Firefox or something. Um, and there, are, there is a way to encode this kind of context dependent sizing rules. There's like so many different places to, to, to modify these things. And it seemed like quite a dry little subject to me, but you know, um, what do I know? Um, so the, the principal way that you would control the size of a widget, here we're just setting up some data. This is a function that I defined in a package that we were using last week. So if I um, right, uh, so new GIO. So here, um, if I call this function uh, with this data. And then I'll have to bounce this out to the browser to view it. Um, I'll pull that over again. So that creates an image that looks like this. Um, if I um, set equals 50%, say, and then do the same thing, it will be a, a much smaller image. So there's a way by simply by passing these width and height values in, you can set the initial size of your thing, um, of, of your widget. And that's passed through to create widget. There are more um, complicated ways of um, setting. You can actually um, use pixels as well as percentages, but you wouldn't typically hard code a, a, a kind of pixel and a number of pixels when doing this. Um, so for sizing visualizations, you can use those width and height arguments um, in your widget function on the on the R side. That gives your user a way to set 
width and height. Um, there is a sizing policy argument in Create Widget, which I don't think I showed. Do I show that here? No, I don't think I. Sorry, um, I meant to include an example of that. Um, and what what the sizing policy? So, for example, you'd in the in the book it does has something that looks like this: sizing policy equals. something like that anyway and that w with that there's there's a few different ways that uh, you can mod it probably not revealed by that but um there are this argue this parameter here gives you as a developer a way to specify different kind of sizing behavior um for for different contexts so depending on whether it's in a browser or dr studio viewer or something like that um, I don't have a good example to show you for, for that. Um, the thing I did want to show you was this resize function. Um, so in the in here, to use the resize function, you'd have to move this out here, or maybe have. Um, so you might initialize that variable outside and then here you can use that um it, so it's something like controller dot resize update each of the libraries may each of the javascript libraries may have its own kind of system for updating the size of a, a an image based on you know changes to the browser window and things um and you may need to access things like width and height and stuff like that um and there's a few examples in the book of how that's treated within Plotly and within charts.js, chart.js, um, and they all have a slightly different syntax. What I did find out though was that after like working through the ideas, is that you don't actually have to specify this for um, the GIO thing. It kind of automatically handles it. I don't know where's my browser window gone. Uh, there. So if I, so it kind of changes automatically even though I haven't set the that resize function for this particular uh, version of the, the package. Um, yeah, so that, although I've shown you that that can be done, it's not necessary to be done, but you do need that controller object to be defined outside of the resize function. Um, oh yeah, and there was an example in Plotly. Um, so if you actually read, the the plot this is the html widgets the, the kind of javascript function for the plotly r package um and the resize function looks like this um so it it's like just a single statement basically um whereas the render value function goes on for whoa a thousand lines um yeah so i mean this sort of stuff it might it might be important to you down the line but it, it feels like it's kind of um uh, it feels like it could quite happily be a last minute modification to your package if you're if you're building a um html widget thing um certainly given that a lot you know some of the javascript libraries will automatically rescale and, and things for you without you having to define those resize functions um anyway um so there's there's that i don't know whether um yeah was there anything else 
yeah so that's just a, a, a kind of a, a lot of a lot of time to just talk about how to resize an image and then to find out that it wasn't that important in the first place um right um uh, there's there's another function that i was going to mention which allows you to um add a bit of content before or after your widget so um this um where are we prepending content yeah so in in here um we can define a function like so um and the aim here is to define a function that will make some html and then um add that hold on well, if i if i just uh if i save that you can have a look at the content of it g x for example is just a, a data frame of, of stuff um i can um set up a, a title say any to HTML tools, H3. Right, and then um, I can prepend, have I got the, oh, I've spelt it wrong, content onto G title. Will that change now that should create a new hold on yeah so it's added the title there um and the author suggests that if you're going to use this um prepend content and append content which will add something so prepend content will add some html before the widget append content will add it afterwards um your kind of best practice is to create a, a function that would allow you to um, do that as a user rather than having to know the innards of HTML widgets if you provide a function for your user that such that they that you know it's a bit more explanatory than you know knowing the ins and outs of um it, whatever html you might need to know um i'll get out of there right um da, 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 da. yes and the the reason that you can do that is because create widget returns an r object of class html widgets and we saw last week that with that html widget object you can append content to it you can modify the data frame within it and things like that um anyway so what was the i think the next thing is the dependencies section cool right um so um on a tangent again um the dependencies of uh, the JavaScript libraries that we we're using here. Um, so what we've done so far is basically what we've got here, where we've specified for for this package that we put together, we've got um, a dependency on this 3D JavaScript library, and then a dependency on GIO. So three is actually a, a dependency of gio so we only ever actually call functions within this library um but we've had to hard code our dependencies we've had to hard code the versions of those libraries that we're using and we've had to uh well we haven't had to but we have downloaded the relevant version of each of those libraries into our r package for to to you know to bundle the code along with the functions that the user might call 
Um, and what, um, now the, there's a slight issue there. So for example, um, maybe GIO is sufficiently narrow in scope, but this can't be the only R package ever to have you to have to have a dependency on the three D JavaScript visualization library. Um, so, if you're creating, if you as a user are creating a report that might use the GIO functions from this package and maybe a kind of terrain or something like that from some other package that uses a 3D JavaScript library. The version of this may conflict. The, the version of 3 used in this package may conflict with the version of 3 used in that other package that you're, you're, you're using. Um, and that can cause problems. So if, you know, if there are, if, depending on the order that the packages are loaded and things like that, and, uh, you know, things, you know, if, if any breaking changes have occurred within those libraries since um, this was embedded in here and it was embedded in the other package, these can cause conflicts between the two libraries. Um, so, um, so there's so there's conflict possible, but there's also a slight inefficiency, and I think the inefficiency is probably the more um, common thing. So you might end up if if you've got if you have to load a particular library for your own widget to work, and you also have to load a, a, the the same library to get another widget to work in the same report, you may end up with the same library being loaded multiple times, which is kind of an inefficient use of the network and, and whatnot. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Yes, there was another thing mentioned. Um, uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll, come, we'll come to the, the kind of suggested solution for that issue uh, later. Um, here, um, there was an example for eCharts where um, you may not necessarily need, eCharts is a very rich visualization library. And um, if you actually look at this website, um, hopefully it'll work. Yeah. Um, so within eCharts, you have available function functions to create all of these kinds of plots. But if you're building a widget that um, takes advantage of say the tree build tree viewer uh, functions from from eCharts, you don't necessarily want your users to have to transfer all of the code for every single type of these. Uh, plots um, when you know the you know the code may be ten percent five percent of uh, of it just to do the the functionality that you need. So there is a way here um, in in this thing. So if you click on a few types of plots that you might want to gen want to use in your widget and an appropriate version of that library, then you can da, 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 download a version of that and it will build the appropriate package. Hopefully the package will be slightly smaller than it would be if you were downloading everything else. Um, so that seemed quite interesting. So that's a... Um, so you might embed that in your package rather than the whole thing. Um, this is um, the 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 further thing is um, sorry, sorry. Um, not every one of your users is going to need ev um, if 
Um, it's very easy to add lots and lots of dependencies into your into your package be you an r developer or a javascript developer and um because it will add more uh, a, a kind of richer experience for your users but sometimes it's not a good idea to make all of those dependencies absolutely necessary for the functioning of your um, package or your library um so one of the things that's discussed in the chapter is um, if you were to set up a widget that depended on a library but only depended on it in certain circumstances, how would you encode that? So um, if you put that kind of optional dependency in here, then it would, uh, then whenever your widget is loaded into an HTML page, those dependencies will be loaded but if that html page doesn't actually use the optional library then you've downloaded a library for no real reason um and there's a um yes so there's a section that describes a tool called the html dependency uh, so this is a function in the html tools package which I think when John, the author, when he joined us, of, you know, at the start of this book club, he mentioned this um, function um, in passing. Um, so uh, what is it now? Stats.js. I'll get that up. So this is um, ooh, it's a, web, a proper website. Yes, so what this is, it's like a kind of performance monitor. Um, and say, um, it might be something useful to have, you know, if you're the developer working on a, a, a package and you're trying to work out why it's slow in certain circumstances and things like that, this might be a useful package to, a useful library to be able to embed in a page such that you can work out what's going wrong in a, a certain circumstances but you don't necessarily want all your users to have that loaded every time you uh, uh, your widgets loaded um, the, um, so there's a, a kind of uh, demonstration of how to make um, this library available as an optional dependency in the um, uh, the GIO package that we were building. And what you do, do I need that? I don't need that, actually, I'll delete that for now. Um, Right, um, so I'll take you through how that's actually done. So what we're going to do is develop a function, GIO stats, that um, will wrap, that you can, so you can call um, this function here, GIO, with some data, and it will create a widget and send it to the browser, and you'll be able to view the content. If you call this function on the output of that, it will ensure that that stats.js library is made available and can check on the um, behavior of your page. Um, so what we're going to do is, uh, so the, the workflow is pretty similar to, to what we did. Basically, you, you download a, a minified version of the JavaScript library and you put it in the package next to where, um, next to where everything else goes. So your GIO dependency and your three dependency are in there. So you'd also download the stats um, library into that folder. Then, um, 
rather than encoding the dependency like as a kind of fixed dependency here, we're going to use this um, function HTML dependency, um, which contains all the information about you know where can the library be found and uh, uh, you know and, and within which are packages available and what's the file path for it there um and yeah so the the source code to do that um you basically you, you set up this html dependency object and then append it to um hold on what was it so did i save something yeah so if you look here this is um g is the output of a call to new gio so this is an html widgets object which is yet to be printed to the screen um it's got x which is the data that's presented by the the thing it has a dependencies entry within it and it's that dependencies argument that dependencies entry within the the the, the object that we're going to modify um let's see i might as well copy it straight from the book actually um, 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 um oh i don't know whether that's my my searches but <laughs> our youtube group has just come up as the top search it's uh javascript for for r um right that's a bit more like it um right so what we're going to do um is we're going to define this function um where are we dependencies and Oh yeah, I meant to show um, this thing. Um, so, where were we? Chats, local host. So, if I if I'm viewing this, I can see all the libraries that are read in. If I go to the network page and reload, you can see um the point at which those libraries were read in and also you can see information about how long it took to load each of the um libraries um so um that kind of information is quite useful certainly if you're you know if you're trying to troubleshoot why things are taking a long time to to load and stuff that is a, a useful tab to to know about um right let's do this um okay so what we're gonna do is i'm gonna add i'll just add it in here um what was it called gio start uh, no not start gio stats yeah so i'm live coding this i apologize if everything goes wrong um, 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 um so what we need is to first we need to run the following code and that just downloads standard um let's download starts.js Mm, I think I might leave it to be honest. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm um, aware of the time to be honest. Basically, the code to do this, if you look in the book, um, the it explains. You know, you have to download the appropriate library, then. Um, then you he sort of gradually builds up this function to uh, append the html dependency to um a html widget so this here the g argument is um a widget object 
um, is defining the dependency uh, where you can find it within this particular package um, and which of the scripts within that directory are the ones that you want to load into um, the, the, the web page. Um, and the way that that's done is by appending to that dependencies entry within the, um, the, the widget object. So you're appending whatever was previously sitting in that entry with this uh, dependency. Um, and um, oh yeah, and he's added an extra little thing in here. So this is modifying the the data that is transferred with the widget um, that tells that is used by your code to to know that the user wants to use that stats live. Um, so this is just a kind of flag to indicate that the library is to be used. Um, and so to make that work, you would then UGIO, you would in here, in your render value thing, you would have controller, blah, blah, blah. Then if X dot stats control dot I can't remember exactly what the syntax was. Was it add stats or something? Oh, I've lost my page. Um, but you basically you have to modify the render function on the JavaScript side so that it knows, you know, conditionally it will use that stats live. Um, and you need to modify the, um, yeah, you ha have to add a function such that the dependencies can be added to your widget object. Now, when I was reading through this, I was thinking, um, this is fine, but if I was making, um, if, if, I, if I didn't have access to the, you know, if I was trying to build an extension package such that, um, you know, for, for all the HTML widgets that have already been published, or one of them or something, I just wanted to be able to add some additional functionality from a JavaScript library. I wouldn't necessarily have access I wouldn't necessarily be able to modify the render function in here. And although I could modify the dependencies of the widget created, I wouldn't necessarily have access to, to modify this, the, the JavaScript code here. So I was wondering what the best pattern would be to build an extension Pack, an extension of an existing HTML widget. And I can't really think what a good idea would be, really. Um, Unless, I mean, maybe just venture, wildly venture. Uh, sorry, hear me. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry about that. I, I've got a webcam that's meant to, to pick up my voice, but anyway. Um, uh, so just to venture maybe like a wild guess, I wonder if in like the API of the function, you know, maybe you could have just a, a way that you can inject some JavaScript, but this that still doesn't get at your, I think your point of, you know, but what about libraries, right? You know, yeah. I mean, it's all well and good to kind of maybe inject some just raw base JavaScript, if I can say it that way, but still, I mean, why not build on top of, 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 uh, yeah. uh I don't know. No, no, I don't know. It was, it was just, I was thinking about it, like looking at this code and, and what was mentioned earlier in the chapter about how, you know, this variable um, isn't necessarily available to this function unless you move it out here. And, you know, as such, presumably that variable won't be available to anyone 
any other part of the page. Um, so I can't necessarily have my own kind of render value and resize function for an extension of uh, a widget, but I, I don't really know what, how it would, but I don't have a use case at the moment, so it's all academic. Um, um, yes, but I, th I thought it was quite interesting. So the recommendation here, for things that your, your package, uh, sorry, things that your widget cannot function without, you should put those into the YAML file. So put them in here. Um, if there is an optional dependency, um, use the HTML dependency um, workflow. There was also, there was a kind of side note um, where um, if an existing R package already exists that includes a dependency, a JavaScript dependency that your package needs, it may make sense to just have a kind of R dependency on that R package. So for example, um, I th there was something about leaflet in here. Um, what was it again? Uh, he mentions that, um, da, 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 da. Hmm, it's funny. Oh, maybe it was in the conflicts section. Um, yeah, so there's a package eCharts for R that depends where eCharts itself depends on Leaflet, um, a, another JavaScript library. And um, the Leaflet library had already been made available in a um, R package called Leaflet. So rather than embedding the library again in a second thing that may end up causing conflicts if the versions of leaflet are out of sync with each other um he made e charts for r depend on the um r package for, for leaflet rather than em embedding an, an additional javascript library um you can actually with the, with this approach um, you can actually access the, there's something, what is it, get dependency uh, function that will access the details that, that specify the, 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 the HTML dependencies for a different R package. So there's a way of embedding directly into your own package without having it in your YAML file. Um, I think that's everything. Oh yeah, the the only other thing that I thought was interesting. Sorry, that's quite dismissive. Um, there's a there's a section at the very end called performances, um, and this is again a, a slightly different topic. Um, so so what have we covered today? We've covered. A little bit about kind of resizing and 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 with that learned a bit about javascript scope there's a little bit about kind of adding additional html around above or below your your the widget that you've created um there was quite a big section on dependencies and and making sure that they're compatible and they're efficiently loaded and things like that um the performance section of this chapter um takes a slightly different tack. I guess it, it kind of related to the efficient loading of the JavaScript libraries, but it's more about getting your data efficiently over to um, the browser. So, um, so there, yeah, so the, the example is if you're using kind of, you know, big like geographical data sets or something like that, that will be relatively static from one, um, visualization to the next it may make sense to um wrap that data up in a kind of static file that's served along with your site rather than transferring a serialized version of the data across the um, network um the the I, I, I can make no vouchers for the speed of one 
type of data transfer versus another but it does make some sense in that like on the r side you'd be transferring reconverting data structures transferring across and then you'd be doing the inverse operation in the javascript side whereas you could just import um that data into the just into the javascript script in your html page i believe um ryan do you have any sense for well i was just going to ask ryan s just left the the conversation but this is actually a topic near and dear to his heart he had posted in our slack channel uh or or one of the slack channels uh regarding the uh best way of, of data management in a shiny app and mm. this kind of touches on that same subject uh is it better to serve it to the browser is it better to manipulate it on the server side uh, what is the yeah. Even even the discussion of the format of the data that you're passing uh, could be subject to uh, optimized as well. Yeah. But no, this has been a, a, a rewarding uh, chapter, and I want to apologize for missing out last week. Oh, no, don't worry about that. But uh, yeah, it's um, yes, it, it is it is an interesting it's an interesting bunch of topics. I, I didn't think that the site when, when like the first section came up and it was about like sizing images, I thought, Oh my God, this is going to be tedious. Um, and there was some interesting stuff and there was different aspects of sizing that I didn't know about. Like, um, but yeah, the, the data transfer thing w seemed quite an interesting uh, approach and, and whether, um, it, yeah, I, I imagine for Shiny, where you've got a lot of kind of back and forth between the browser and the server, well, it I was may gonna... be a different constraints over where you're serving an, a visualization that's interactive within the browser. So yes. all the data has to be available in the browser. Um, in there's a there's a there's a project that I'm very, very intrigued with, or or that I'm tracking with uh, very loosely. I'm 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 not I'm not directly uh, doing any anything with them, but um, the uh, ADL is the Advanced Distributed Learning Group. It's a it's a somehow associated to the the uh, Navy. Uh, it's a DoD derivative. Anyway, um, they have a new JavaScript library, and it's it's called the X API. So um, experience API, some people will call it tin can. And what it does is it it takes SCORM, which is scalable content object reuse model, the uh, older versions of e-learning and, and your browser interactions with the server, et cetera, tracking with, with users' progress. This new X API accesses a different method using JavaScript to achieve it. Now, you don't have a learning or you don't have a learning management service anymore, LMS, you have an LRS, a learning record store. And what it does is every time you trigger this JavaScript, it pings and, and records it to this LRS. What is more important of this whole topic is R as a service to access the analytics of that LRS, manipulate it, change it, modify it, et cetera. And it has direct reflection of just the JavaScript library in general. Yeah. You had posted in Slack uh, earlier about uh, uh, potential uh, topics of uh, discussion, and, and I think uh, Arthur may jump in with this as well, but um, it was the opportunity of presenting something that is kind of near and dear to you, and, and but yeah, may have yeah. some uh, access in other areas as well. And I'm, I'm seeing this bridge, at least with this JavaScript book club, I'm seeing a bridge of possibly showcasing or accessing that. Cool, um, cool. Arthur, I think this this kind of runs closely into the topic or, or the conversation we're having about the Advanced R Book Club tomorrow with the, the functions chapter as well. Something that is um, a curiosity to the user and, and then presenting it that way. But... All right, okay, cool. Yes, um, so um, good. Um, next week um arthur's offered to present is it next week or yeah yeah uh, and then in two weeks time i think we'll i think we'll um abort two weeks time from now and do chapter 10 the following week instead so we'll have a week off and then uh finish section two part two um what i'd like um with the, the the chapter ten of the book is really short. Um, the um, so it 
uh, what I'd quite like is to just cover that quite quickly and then see if um, we can't uh, discuss, you know, use cases of, of HCM and widgets that, that have entered our life. Um, or maybe try to um, use HCM and widgets on a library that, that, that's of interest. So yeah, that what you describe in Ryan sounds like it would really fit in there. Um, but yeah, I had planned to finish this section of the book in two weeks time, take a week off and then start the shiny section of the book. Um, but yeah, Arthur's going to our studio conf. So, uh, so uh, that sounds, uh, that sounds good. It, it, it's just because there's only so few, few of us that it, it makes sense to try and make sure there's as many of us as possible at these meetings. Um, great. Um, so I'll see you next week for, um, oh, yes, no, it's quite interesting, chapter nine, isn't it? Um, the, the, on kind of linking different widgets together. Um, cool. Um, good. Right. Thanks for everyone coming along today. Um, hey, Russ, a uh, really, really quick one, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. I ask again, uh, like I did last week, because I know, I know, I know that you love to dig, dig, dig deep huh? into to these topics. So have you found anything? Uh, I guess it's my quest for the holy grail of sort of like uh, HTML widgets for dummies. Uh, have, have you found any kind of like good entry points for for us? I mean, I guess you're. It, it looks as if you're like perennially returning to the documentation and kind of finding how the documentation sort of um, uh, helps 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 with the book and then vice vice versa yeah, but I was wondering if yeah. you'd found any other resources that might be good for for us uh, to explore outside of uh, our sessions um, uh, yeah, um, I did find I mean I did find a section in the um, our markdown um, cookbook I think um but it was it was more like a kind of um it was like uh it's not displaying i thought it was i thought it was about creating a widget um i don't have a kind of um a simple get up and running kind of um example to be honest i mean i th i think probably the the chapter that Ryan presented is is as good a an example of that um, as as any. Um, yeah, um, but yeah, I, to be honest, I think the the HTML widgets documentation probably um, it, it's 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 okay. It's not, I mean, there's improvements that could probably be made, but uh, I think given that the the book exists now it, it it the book seems like a a a better way to get up to speed with building html widgets but um yeah so i, I don't really i don't really have any good example at the at the moment now <laughs> right anyway i ought to head off um have a nice week everyone enjoy your um <laughs> your unfeasible temperatures, Ryan. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> right, cool. And um, yeah, I'll see you all next week for Arthur's uh, talk on the uh, next chapter. Cool. Wish me luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye. All right. Bye bye.